Good evening. My name is Jim Garvey, and I'm the Dean of the Knoxville Chapter of the American Guild of Organists. It's, I'm here at First Methodist Church in Oak Ridge to present the presenter of our September program, the first one of our 2020-20 month series. This would be Mr. Josh Sumter, who is the music associate here at First Methodist Church, and the organist as well. Josh is someone who is very much known to us in the Knoxville chapter of the AGO. He first began to play on the annual student recital when he was still in high school. Thereafter, he pursued his music studies at Maryville College, getting a bachelor's with Ashley Burrell there, and later getting his master's degree in organ performance from the University of Tennessee under Edie Johnson. The subject of tonight's presentation is the history of the organ in the Americas, beginning in the 1600s, and I think Josh will take it through all the way to the present day. Uh, I will refer you to the other year events on our Knoxville chapter website. That would be www.agonoxville.org. Programs will be posted monthly on the first Monday of the month. So without further ado, I would give the floor to Josh Sumter, or shall I say, the virtual platform. Hi, and welcome to AGO Knoxville's first online presentation. As Jim said, I'm Josh Sumter, organist and music associate here at First United Methodist Church of Oak Ridge. I will be presenting a paper I wrote during my time at UT. It will cover the development of the organ in the United States from before its founding through the 20th century. I hope you enjoy the program. Since the time of its invention, the organ has undergone numerous changes depending on multiple factors, including the needs of the church, the desires of the organist, and the prevailing taste. Starting in the 16th century, organs began making their way to the New World. Squelched by puritanical conservatism and the cost of shipment, the organ did not gain a prominent foothold in what would become the United States until the latter part of the 17th century. However, as restrictions eased, frequency of shipment increased, and organ builders began moving to the New World, we can see a boom in organ production and popularity. If we are to start at the beginning of the organ in what would become the United States, it may surprise some of you to learn that the, or the first organs of the New World were not found in New England or other northern colonies. The first American organs were, in fact, present in the Spanish colonies that extended up into the modern-day southwestern United States. New Spain was a place dominated by a quest for wealth as well as by a mission to spread Catholicism amongst the indigenous peoples. As a result, a great number of monks and priests traveled to the New World in order to set up missions, and later on cathedrals and other large churches. Many of the missions that extended up into present U.S. only held barrel organs, organs that were operated by a crank very similar to a music box. It is in records of the first Dominican cathedral in New Spain that we see indications of organists as early as 1512 and where there are organists, there must be organs. That was certainly true in Mexico City, where remnants and even mostly whole organs can be found from this period. However, our focus is on the development of the organ in what would become the United States. According to Juan de Torquemada, in a correspondence from 1712, there were organs installed in nearly all the churches. This holds to reason, since as more colonists arrived from Spain and Portugal, they would want the comforts of home. So, in order to understand the organs of New Spain, one need only look to the source of their inspiration, the Iberian Peninsula. Organs of the 17th and 18th century in Spain, though distinct, exhibited influences of the Dutch, French, and Italian schools of, the, of that time, perhaps due to their Catholic predilections. Modest one-manual instruments were the most common. These instruments of New Spain generally included a few principles, flutes, and mutations. One prominent feature of Spanish and New Spanish organs was the use of a split keyboard, something attributable to the limitations of having only one manual. While some small reeds could be found on early instruments, 
It was not until the middle of the 17th century that larger reeds, such as trumpets, were added. The most interesting and enduring tradition to Spanish organs were the horizontal trumpets commonly called trompeta en batalla, or the trumpet in battle. These boisterous reeds could liven up an occasion and had a lasting impact as we still incorporate horizontal trumpets in the present day. However, as familiar as these features seem, it should be noted that the impact of organs in New Spain had little effect on the overall development of the organ in the United States. This can be attributed to the negative relations between colonizing countries, as well as the eventual dominance of English culture. Moving further east, we will find some of the French colonists. Although France was, like Spain, a predominantly Catholic country, the French colonists in the New World were very often Calvinists seeking refuge from religious persecution. As a result of the Huguenots' pilgrimage, metrical psalmody was introduced to the Americas. It is suggested that the Huguenots brought with them the French or Genevan Psalters as they arrived in Florida in the 1560s. However, aside from singing the psalms, Calvinists such as the Huguenots did not possess an innate musical heritage as music was largely omitted in Calvinist churches. Furthermore, the Huguenots usually merged with the local populations and thus did not retain a unique cultural identity. As a result, the French influence on the American organ is something that was not present in colonial America outside of the influences exerted on the organs of Europe that were brought over. Traveling northward to the middle colonies, we find German settlers who come from the Lutheran tradition, a tradition known for its use of music as a tool for teaching their faith. The German Catholics developed within their service a tradition known as Alternatum, in which the organist would improvise or play an interlude between the lines of a chant. As the Lutherans broke away and began using chorale tunes, this tradition of Alternatum tended to continue and to develop. So, being at the fore of Lutheran spiritual life, the organs of Germany began making their way to the colonies. Pennsylvania, a Lutheran stronghold, was known for its abundance of organs going into the 1700s, around the time of the now exalted Bach and his contemporaries. In fact, it was at a Lutheran ordination service in 1703 that the instance of the first organ used in corporate worship can be found. This organ was lent to the church by an order of monks founded by Johannes Kelpius, known as the Hermits of Wissahickon. It was a small, positive-like organ of two or three stops. By the 1730s, the increasing number and quality of organs, particularly in German colonies, is shown in the fact that organists like Johann Puckelbell's own son, Karl Theodor, had made their way to live in the colonies. Although the German colonies did cherish the organ, the influence of German organs would not directly influence the development of the American organ until nearly 200 years later. Arriving in New England, we find the supposed origin of our modern culture in the United States. The English colonies would eventually dominate America culturally in the time before and after the War for Independence. The Puritans were the original New Englanders and were present in increasingly large numbers. Having fled religious persecution in England, they traveled to Holland and subsequently to the New World. By the 1660s, the Puritans had come to allow some religious freedom through the Halfway Covenant in which community members were allowed to participate in church activities without fully professing belief in their doctrine. This was a method for the more progressive Puritans to gain more membership. Even with slightly looser restrictions, there remained a steadfast resistance against instrumental music in worship, as evidenced by a doctrinal tract by John Cotton. We find in this tract that instrumental music is approved for private devo devotion only. In spite of the lack of corporate musical experiences by the Puritans, the first organ used in the service of the Christian Church in New England was made possible by a Puritan. Thomas Brattle, founder of Brattle Square Church, was the treasurer of Harvard and owned a small pipe organ that was kept in his home. Written in his will, the organ was bequeathed to his beloved Brattle Square Church, who, being Puritans, denied acceptance. 
It was then offered to the Anglican Church, King's Chapel in Boston. They accepted and in 1713 became the first recorded instance of a permanent church organ in New England. The Brattle organ was of an unknown English origin, but it is suspected to be from the shop of either Renatus Harris or Bernard Smith. Like other colonial organs, the stop list was modest and only included principles eight foot and four foot, a two foot flute, and a small two rank sesquialtero. Nearing the turn of the 19th century, there are records of approximately 20 organs in the New England colonies. This is not so surprising given the hardships faced by settlers. And just like earlier Spanish settlers, the high cost of building and shipping an organ from New England was a great deterrent. That being said, by the 19th century, the majority of churches with organs in New England were outposts of the Church of England. Again, much like the organs of New Spain, it is useful to consider the organs of England during the 1600s and 1700s in order to understand the organs of New England at that time. English organs were modest and included only principles, flutes, and occasional mutations. Even more rare than mutations were reeds, mixtures, and pedals. The seemingly lacking English organs were not without merit, as they were the instruments played by now highly regarded composers such as Henry Purcell, John Stanley, and George Friedrich Handel. Works written by these greats were primarily simple pieces called voluntaries, with the exception of Handel, who wrote the great organ concerti. As these voluntaries migrated to the colonies, they were to become more like the early Italian elevation toccatas and that they were to become improvisatory pieces used to cover silent moments as the priest moved about or perform, pr performed a liturgical function. What we know now as moving music. As organ music had become an integral and expected aid to worship in England, so the existence of church organs in New England was primarily limited to Anglican offshoots at the Church of England, later to become the Episcopal Church. Not existing within a musical vacuum, the organ's development has been influenced by shifts in societal attitude. One widespread change in the colonies was an eventual religious tolerance that culminated in the Great Awakening of the 1730s. Within this movement, there was a shift in the focus of colonial theology from emphasis on a benign and even benevolent creator to an emphasis on human sin. By focusing on this element of faith, ministers could use fear of damnation to bring congregants to repentance and salvation. This tactic was not without consequence as an emotional response was deemed increasingly appropriate for a true Christian experience. Music, being considered a purveyor of emotion, even by ancient Greek philosophers, would eventually become a more attractive method of reaching emotional fervor. This unintended result of the Great Awakening was aided by the ideals and tastes of the subsequent Romantic era. During this time, instrumental music would flourish as the finite power of spoken word was diminished in lieu of the mysterious and self-prescribed meaning of the music. Thanks to an emphasis on evocative instrumental music, the organ would soon dominate the musical landscape of the American church. Proceeding into the 19th century, changing attitudes toward music would necessitate changes to the organ that would never be forgotten. In the de decades preceding the turn of this century, organs in America were mostly fairly modest instruments that exerted primarily an English influence. However, due to an influx of immigrants into the newly minted United States, different tastes regarding music and organs were being injected into the once homogenous musical landscape. Since there was an increasing abundance of German settlers, organs in the style began making appearances. This style helped introduce things we take for granted, including pedal boards, more mutations, and mixtures, as well as some reeds. Increased immigration along with indus industrialization of the Victorian era would quickly lead to an explosion in the number and types of organs being produced in the newly created United States. 
following economic procedure, as the su supply of organs increased, the cost was reduced. So larger organs were be beginning to be installed across this new nation. Not all churches could afford these new large instruments, though. Smaller and more rural congregations relied heavily upon reed organ or harmonium that was then being produced in Europe. Although the harmonium would become a symbol of a poor church in the U.S., many fine organists were known to have composed for the instrument, including Théodore Dubois, Alexandre Guillemont, Louis Vierne, and César Franck. In fact, Franck's l'organiste has almost become canon in pedagogical organ repertoire. Unsurprisingly, the U.S. inherited the European harmonium and began producing its own version. Henry Mason and Emmons Hamlin improved on the design and produced their own cabinet organ. Later, the Esty Organ Company in Vermont gained widespread popularity for their reed organs that were soon used in churches and in homes. This acclaim may have been spurred on by their production of portable pump organs that were often used by churches for revivals and picnics. It is also known that they were used during the devotional times on the field during the Civil War. Whatever the reason for their success, the makers of reed organs in the U.S. created a proclivity for organ music in the church that had not been seen since the flourishing of Catholic churches in the Spanish colonies. As the desire for new organs grew, so did the production of pipe organs for those churches with the monetary means. Stalled by the Civil War, organ building began to flourish in the United States by the end of the 19th century. Builders such as David Tannenberg and Johann Klemm brought more German styles to the table. William Goodrich founded the Boston School of Organ Building and influenced Elias and George Hook of Hook and Hastings. Matthias Peter Moller, a Dutch immigrant, moved to Hagerstown, Maryland in 1880 and would eventually design organs that would become known as the American classic design, much like the one you see right behind me. Following the growth of organ production, the organ recital made its debut in the United States. In the late 19th century, thanks primarily to Dudley Buck, organ recitals became more common. Buck was also greatly responsible for the founding of the American Guild of Organists in 1896. And thanks to scholarship by him and Linwood Farnham, an interest in music of the earlier masters was cultivated in the US. There was now a buzz in the organ world that would result in a flowering of organ building and organ repertoire. Proceeding from the 19th century into the 20th century, there is a move toward the orchestral style in which the organ is meant to imitate the sounds of an orchestra. Thanks to the Romantic era, music was becoming increasingly programmatic, so organists wanted instruments that could fulfill the duties of imitation and emotion. Although the early 20th century was a pivotal time for the organ, music's progress left the church and now resided more in the concert hall. This created an environment in which the church organ was now being required to compete with the orchestras and silent film accompaniment. Robert Hope Jones, noted English inventor and organ builder, immigrated to the United States in 1903 and brought with him a wealth of inventive ideas for organ building. Hope Jones was a proponent in the alteration of organ building that led to the widespread, widespread use of swell boxes and shutters, electro-pneumatic consoles, pistons, and some new pipe designs. It is worthy to note that many of these new pipe designs were primarily used in the burgeoning field of theater organs rather than church organs. The combined influence of a variety of organ styles and musical traditions would lead to what we know as the American symphonic or orchestral organ. Ernest Martin Skinner is hailed as the epitome of this orchestral style and was active in the decades surrounding the turn of the 20th century. The organs of Skinner's day were influenced by the great organists of Romantic era Europe. So, building upon the traditions of figures such as Max Reger, César Franck, Charles-Marie Vidor, and Cave Cole, the American organ would set out to produce organs that would allow one man to become an entire orchestra. Organ builders in this tradition began excluding mutations and mixtures from their stop lists. In fact, John T. Austin of Austin Organ Company 
stated he did not include such stops because it is an artificial method of producing brightness and clarity, something best left to a variety of string stops, as in the orchestra. Ernest Skinner did not, however, agree. As time went on, he felt that mutations and mixtures provided a tonal depth and character that was lacking without them. A zenith of this style of organ built by George S. Hutchings is the Newberry organ found in Yale's Woolsey Hall. According to detailed specifications, none of the mixtures now found on the organ are original. They were added later by Ernest Skinner. The result of differing and converging styles in the melting pot of America was the American orchestral organ. These organs possessed an increased number of stops and divisions, electrum, pneumatic action, more pistons, and concave pedals. Developing concurrently with the American orchestral organ, there were organs that in a real sense were meant to replace the orchestra. The theater organ is a development in the organ world that is quite unique to the United States. Early examples of organs in theaters actually resembled the organs popular in churches. In fact, many of these organs were built by the same firms that built church organs during the early 20th century, including Kimball, Esty, Austin, Hinners, and Moeller. These straight organs were not necessarily popular with audiences. Musicologist Rick Altman cites two instances from the 1910s in which columnists called into question the organ's ability to effectively relate the music to the scenes unfolding on screen. The idea was that a specific connotation of reverence and religiosity was given to the organ, and that the organ was therefore unable to portray all the actions and emotions on screen. The instrument we have come to know as the theater organ was actually predated by a number of ingenious mechanical contraptions. Perhaps one of the most influential on the creation of the theater organ was the Wurlitzer Pian Orchestra. It was used to mimic the sounds of an orchestra and cr could produce the following, piano, bass drum, snare drum, kettle drum, cymbals, castanet, xylophone, orchestra bells, chimes, mandolin, violin, cello, flute, piccolo, clarinet, saxophone, oboe, and bassoon. It is worth mentioning that the theater organ quickly replaced the orchestra because of its ability to quickly change moods and tunes based on the flexibility of having only one musician controlling the musical accompaniment. It was only by the advancements in organ technology mentioned previously, such as the balanced swell shoe, mul multiple enclosed divisions, electro-pneumatic action, and unification, that the theater organ was able to express a full enough range of emotion to accompany film. During the middle of the 20th century, there were those, like Skinner, who opposed the thick and often muddy sounds of the American orchestral-style organs, likely because of their similarities to theater organs. However, the yearning for clarity by builders such as Holtkamp tended to swing too far in the other direction. It is in this spirit that we find the pure organs of the 20th century. Hearkening to the Orgelbewegung in Europe, some reformers in the United States decided that the American symphonic organs were too much of a departure from the organ's history. These reformers denounced eclecticism in favor of pure organs that mimicked only one style of building and were often based on one specific builder or even one organ. Arp Schnitger, a 17th century organ builder from Germany known for his colorful stops, was admired by many purists. The organs resulting from this movement exhibited mechanical and tra tracker actions, no pistons, and bright mixtures and thin reeds, a sound I would guess is far from Bach's preferred gravitas. Even further from Baroque ideals were the facades and pipe arrangements, the purest reform organs generally had an overall angular and thoroughly modern appearance to them, perhaps a way to keep these pure historical organs rooted in the modern day. Whatever the reason, it seems this movement, like, like the Orgelbewegung, was in part historically informed yet poorly executed. By the late 20th century, the dust had settled and true eclecticism won out. 
Organs that could play all manner of music, including historical literature, were being produced while retaining the modern conveniences such as pistons, light action, and concave pedal boards. Other organs were still being produced in the name of historical tradition, but now they began retaining the color and charm that were present in the Baroque era. Organ firms such as Fisk and Bedient began producing historically informed instruments that could compete with their eclectic counterparts. After a period of upheaval as certain organ schools jockeyed for dominance, the great melting pot of the United States combined the styles into the American classic organs we know today. Organs that, for the most part, can do it all. I hope you enjoyed tonight's program. This is the first of eight online offerings planned for our chapter. You can find all our programs on our YouTube channel by going to our website, www.ageonoxville.org, and by clicking on the YouTube icon in the upper right-hand corner. Programs may be accessed at the time of their debut and any time thereafter. Again, thank you for joining us.